Hello, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Praise the Lord, church. Hallelujah. We're standing together. And it's good to be in church on this beautiful first Sunday of the month of October. I mean, it's enjoying the cool, crisp air. Amen. And, you know, I do believe that uh, heaven's going to be something like October in North Carolina. Yeah. God bless you. We're going to worship the Lord today in spirit and in truth. We want Him to have His way. We want God's presence to be here in a great way. Whatever need you brought this morning, just make that need known to the Lord. However small you might think it is, however big that the devil may tell you it is, it's impossible. Bring that need to the Lord, and I promise you, He's able to do exceedingly abundantly. Let's look at the Lord today. God, we're to talk to you on this Sunday morning. We're thankful for your presence. We're thankful for your power. We're thankful for your spirit, Lord. We're looking forward to what you're going to do in our hearts on this Sunday morning. We've gathered with faith in our hearts. We've gathered with trust in our spirits this morning. We've gathered with expectancy in our lives today. Hallelujah, Jesus. And the Holy Ghost, we do this place. Hide us together this morning, Lord. Let us sing this service better than the way that we can. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Everybody said amen. 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 We're going to sing a couple courses of worship the Lord. Just look at somebody close by you and welcome them. 
this summer. Amen. And uh, she's moving to another state and could use some uh, good mail help Friday morning at 9 o'clock or Saturday morning at 9 o'clock loading up a truck, whatever you can do. Uh, Ms. Caroline, would you just wave your hand right here? She's sitting on the same row as Mrs. Mary. And if you can see her after church, if you can help Friday morning at 9 o'clock or Saturday morning at 9 o'clock. She's not picky. Whatever you can do, I'm sure she would uh, uh, be thankful for that. Amen. So please, uh, and she said she would pay you as well. She's not asking for it for free, so I forgot to mention that. She said that she would uh, reimburse you for that. So please let her know as soon as the service is over. So look at your neighbor and say, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. Amen. Give the Lord a hand as the ushers come. We're going to give a good word of God today. Thank 
meeting. All right. So uh, the rest of you, be thinking about, praying about what you can do. And if you can answer that, we appreciate it. If you can get that in two weeks from today, then that be the 18th. And uh, we appreciate that. Amen. Right there, a significant uh, discount on that. That's a good looking motor. That's going to help us. Hey, folks, God's yard ought to look better than anybody else's yard in the whole neighborhood. Amen. And, uh, Brother Derek, Brother Freddie, and also Sister Mike, she comes and helps. And Sister Melissa, she comes and helps. These men get their lives involved. I mean, I'm in there studying my sermon, and I hear them out there weeding. And Bella's going crazy. She's known somebody back there doing something. They're working hard. They always keep the yard looking really good. We appreciate that. Somebody say amen. 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 God bless you. Thank you for your faithfulness and giving. Let's bow our heads together. We're going to pray. Lord, upon the authority of your word, I have given and shall be given to me. Press down, shaken together, running over. I am a tither. I bring my tithe today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked. The curse is broken. I live under an open heaven. You pour upon us such a blessing. There is not room enough to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interests and incomes, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished, royalties received. Thank you for our whole family saved and walking with God. Thank you for perfect health and abundance to walk in divine favor and blessing. Stay with me. I am blessed going in. And I'm blessed going out. And all that I do will prosper. In Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Amen. Our ushers are going to wait on you right now. Thank you for your faithfulness and tithes and your offerings. While they're coming through, let me mention our COVID schedule. The nursing home ministry is postponed indefinitely. Wednesday night, 730, uh, midweek service. And uh, with regard to nursing home ministry, nursing homes have opened back up in phase three of Governor Cooper's order. However, some of them still aren't doing extracurricular meetings. And so that's why we're not able to still go back in and have service. Even though family can go in and see, the actual facility says we don't want anything happening uh, other than just normal business. So until we can get back in and have service, that's where we're at. Wednesday night service, uh, prayer for 7, service 7 30. Our youth meet every other week. Saturday night prayer has been postponed indefinitely. Sunday morning, Prayer at 10.30, worship at 11, no Sunday school uh, for the time being. Our youth are having pumpkins and pancakes on Friday night, October the 16th. Pumpkins and pancakes Friday night, October the 16th. And then the last Saturday of the Friday of the month, October 30th, they're having their fall festival night for the youth. So all our young people, there's some exciting things going on. Sister Kaylee is looking forward to uh, joining you by uh, Beyonce's you know, daughter, Kaylee, will be moving here and looking forward to the youth activities. And of course, uh, many of you know I'm getting married on Friday, coming up Friday, so be praying for me. Be leaving Wednesday with all my family, flying out of Raceford Airport, and be in California all day Thursday, Friday, leaving from Honeymoon Saturday morning. Uh, we have our local ministers lined up to take care of the services this Wednesday night, also Sunday morning, and then next Wednesday night, so you're going to have a great time. And uh, let's be here and be faithful. I'll be watching online, not this Wednesday night, because I'll be in the air. But Sunday and next Wednesday, I'll be watching online. I'll be joining with you and in the comments and just uh, saying amen as the local ministers are preaching. Somebody say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right, we started off with 247 Wednesday night on our building fund. And then what do we have for this morning? 1062. Did that include the 247? Well, that includes the 247. All right. So give the Lord a hand clap for one time. Amen. Amen. How do you know? Amen. Some bikes are bigger than others, and some elephants are bigger than others. <laughs> that line of credit we're about to pay off. That's a small elephant compared to our first horse. But if you keep taking good bikes, and you'll get there. We had a great business meeting Wednesday night. We did not televise that uh, because it's a private church business meeting. But the state of the church is great. We are in good shape financially. Our finances are up, and uh, right during the pandemic, and of course, we have new people coming, new babies being born, and we're excited about what the Lord is doing. And I believe the next three months, October, November, December, are going to be the best three months of the year. Amen? Amen. Do you believe that? Knock your hands to the Lord. Do you believe God for greater things? Greater things. Take our children 
out. Let's just want to help them get to their classes. God bless you. Greet one another. Shake hands with someone. Smile. No, no, don't shake hands. <laughs> Man is made lower. 
David said that back in the book of Psalms. Man is made lower than the angels. So here he is, Paul coming along and saying, Jesus is, in the hierarchy of creation, Jesus is lower than the angels because he's also man. For the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. I mean, he's thankful that he gave his life for you. Yes. Amen. Amen. All right. A little bit further down the whole road back there. We're trying to social distance. If you can just spread out, let's not get too many people there. Thank you for that. Amen. I'm thankful he gave his life. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things. Listen to that. By whom? By Jesus are all things. How can all things be by Jesus if Jesus was not also God? Yeah, that's right. He just said in the prior verse that Jesus had to taste death, so he's man. But in the very next verse he says, but all things came by him. How? Because he's God. Right. Jesus is God and man. Right. There are no three persons in the Trinity, three separate distinct beings in the Trinity. There is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. These three are one. Right. Amen. Amen. And here we have two of those uh, characteristics being talked about. And by whom are all things. And bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. I want to talk to you this morning about the suffering of the innocent. We have a whole lot of suffering going on in our world today. Not just in America, but all over the world. It's in the news 24-7. And uh, unless you've been out on a on a yacht somewhere in the middle of the ocean with no internet, no cell phone service, you can probably hear it all the time. The suffering of the innocent. Amen. You may be seated. God bless you. The problem of pain, as the Christian scholar C.S. Lewis once called it, is one of Satan's most deceitful and dishonest weapons against the Christian faith. Amen. If God is good, if God is all-knowing, if God is everywhere present, if God is all-powerful, then why does he let innocent people suffer? Mm -hmm. Satan challenges us with this contemptuous question. Where is this holy righteous God when innocent people suffer anguish and pain. There's a lot of confusion with pain. There's a lot of confusion that comes along with pain. We can understand some of the suffering that comes to mankind. We don't necessarily like it, but at least we can make some sense of it. For instance, we can understand that some pain comes from living in a cursed world. So when you understand the book of Genesis, you understand the story of Adam and Eve and how sin was introduced into the human race, then you can kind of see the big picture and understand why some pain happens is because Adam and Eve plunged the human race into sin. And like the trout swimming back upstream, we humans have been trying to get back to God ever since. Right. So we kind of get that. We also can understand the discomfort of being chastened or corrected by the Lord. Now, uh, you know, when I was a child, and uh, back in the day when parents still whooped their kids, my mama would beat the snot out of me a couple times when I didn't do something I was supposed to do or did something I wasn't supposed to do. And it would not have been very fair to me to say, I don't understand this thing. <laughs> I understood the thing. Right. I knew I did a certain act. She had told me not to do it. I did it anyway. She caught me, and I knew what the repercussions were. We're going to be. So, uh, but when it comes to God, we understand sometimes that if we, you know, run up the credit card to the hill at Christmas and then all of a sudden can't pay the bill again, we're afraid they want, it's not really consistent and congruent and honest for us to cry to the Lord, why are you letting this happen to me? Right. Right. He's just letting you fall into the trap that you set and he told you not to do. Right. So we get that. We understand the pain of recompense. In other words, suffering for our own mistakes. If you don't change the oil in your car, you will blow the engine. Amen. Amen. That's right. 
And it's not really congruent for you to come to the altar and say, God, please heal my car when he didn't break it. You did. Amen. We understand this. We can even understand the suffering for the cause of Christ. But even these four large compartments, so to speak, that I've talked about, these types of pain, as difficult as it is, it conforms each of these, it conforms to our sense of human logic to some degree. We get that. We understand that. But one of the life's most puzzling questions, on top of what we've talked about, is, all right, I understand. I understand that don't change the oil, you're going to blow your engine. I understand if you, as a child, if you disobey your parent, you're going to get a spanking. I understand that Adam and Eve plunged the whole human race into sin. I understand that we're going to suffer for Christ. But it still doesn't answer the question, why do the innocent suffer? Why do children and infants have to suffer disease, affliction, and even death? I, I can't stand to see a child hurting. It just it hurts me inside. It hurts me to see a, a sick child or a, a, a child that's got some type of wound or, or is a, a broken a bone or something. Yeah. I don't like to see innocent children. They didn't do anything. Why do floods and earthquakes and hurricanes and tornadoes and other natural disasters kill and destroy so many people, even Christians sometimes? Why do poor and underprivileged people suffer from disease and poverty? What we're talking about this morning is the suffering of the innocent, the pain of the innocent. In reality, most of the pain that is suffered by innocent people is directly caused by other people, and don't get offended when I say this, but I'm talking about us. For example, parents abandon their children and leave them to suffer alone. So we can't blame that on God. That's a human thing. Humans did that. Alcoholics and drug addicts bring great suffering to their children and families. Greedy dictators and tyrants misrule their domains, causing entire nations to suffer in poverty and illiteracy. People gossip and steal and lie and cheat and murder, and all of this causes pain to our fellow men, fellow women. We're also guilty. Each of us has added to the suffering of the human race by our words or our actions. We have brought suffering into the lives of other people who had no choice in the matter. So before we stand and shake our fist at God and demand justice for the innocent people, we need to review our own record first. If God destroyed every person who had ever hurt someone else, there would nobody be left alive today, including everybody in this room. All suffering can be traced back, directly or indirectly, to human wrongdoing, either from Adam or Eve, the original sin, or someone else's disobedience to God. When we see a child suffer from a disease, we are forced to remember that disease is the legacy of the curse that mankind brought upon itself. There would be no disease if Adam and Eve hadn't plunged the human race into sin. Right. When we see an elderly person suffer from a slowly degenerating body, we must remember that the curse of death comes to everybody. And there would not be the curse of death if Adam and Eve had not plunged the whole human race into sin. Even natural disasters are the result of a planet that is groaning and writhing in the throes of the curse. Romans 8, 22, Paul said, We know that the whole earth, the whole creation, groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. I believe that the earth itself is suffering under the curse of sin. And as a result, earthquakes and storms and floods are ravaging our planet, bringing havoc and heartbreak to millions of people. We can't continue as a human race to pollute this planet and to pollute the air and pollute the water and pollute the topography with chemicals and heavy metals and, and live in blatant sin and expect God to continue to give us fresh water and fresh air. Come on. Right. 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 Think about your house. 
If you had a generator in your house and were constantly running that generator and polluting with carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, you wouldn't want to stay in that house very long. Right. If people were constantly walking around, you know, defecating on the floor, you wouldn't want to stay in that house very long. Right. Come on. Amen. And humankind nowadays, and, and, and listen, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not a crazy, uh, you know, weirdo about this, but we have to take care of our resources. Nice. Right, right. right. Okay? We have to take care of our resources. That's we it. can't clear cut entire forests and wonder why we don't have any oxygen. Amen. Yeah. Go back to your preschool days. Go back to your first grade, second grade, uh, you know, biology, where you had to grow out trees and leave. Photosynthesis is a real deal, folks. Right, yeah. Yeah. Amen. And we're going to have air. We're going to have oxygen. We're going to have water. We're going to have, you know, uh, clouds and pour water and rain upon the earth. we got to have good stuff going up for good stuff to come down. That's it. Yeah. Come on. Preach it. Yep. Nobody is exempt to these sufferings, infants and children and the elderly and the poor and even we Christians are all subject to suffer the anguish caused by the curse. Amen. Amen. I read an article not long ago that was comparing the 1950s until now. It's only been 70 less than 70 years but if you could go back to the 1950s, would you do it? Yep. No internet? No cell phones. You can only watch television in black and white. Even though they lacked a lot of our modern conveniences, people genuinely seemed to be a lot happier back then. Yeah. Families. Families actually ate dinner together. I don't mean they came home work and all six of them slapped something in the microwave and everybody went and got their own TV show, got their own device and watched their own thing. Families sat down and ate dinner together. Right. Neighbors knew each other and cared about one another. Amen. Being an American truly meant something. Right. Today we like to think that we are so much more advanced than they were back then. But the truth is that our society is falling apart. Amen. 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 Right. Could it be possible that we could learn some important lessons by looking back at how Americans lived 70 years ago? So let me give you some examples. In 1950, Texaco, Star Theater, The Lone Ranger, and Hop Along Cassidy were some of the most popular shows that Americans watched on television. Yeah. In 2020, we have a Netflix film called Cuties. So trashy and so disgusting that four states have sent a letter to Netflix asking for it to be removed because it is fodder for those with criminal imaginations serving to normalize the view that children are sexual beings. Come on. In 70 years, we've gone from Hobble Cassidy to pedophilia. Come on. Right. Preach it. Right. Preach it. Right. Right. In 1950, television networks would not even show husbands and wives in the bed together. In 2020, adult websites get more traffic than Netflix, Amazon, and Twitter combined. In 1950, people would greet one another as they walk down the street. In 2020, Americans are too enamored with their cell phones to worry about human contact, and we text each other from across the living room. You know I'm right. We lay in our beds and text someone 40 feet away. Can you bring me a coat? Things have changed in 70 years. In 1950, gum chewing and talking in class were the two top problems in school. In 2020, kids are killing each other. Come on. Right, right. Come on. shooting cops. That's right. 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 In 1950, people would make an effort to dress up and look nice when they go out in public. Yeah. In 2020, most of the population has become utter slobs. Mm -hmm. And Walmart people have become one of our most popular memes. When I first started practicing law, I was on the court appointed list just to uh, get some experience in criminal law, 
and one of my clients came to court dressed in her pajamas. Yep. Oh. Flannel, smiley face pajamas. And we happen to be in front of Judge Banks Prince. You do not want to be in front of Judge Banks Prince on a Monday morning in your pajamas. And this young lady went to jail. Who goes to court in their pajamas? Amen. People in 2020 do. 1950, the typical woman got married for the first time at age 20, and the typical man got married for the first time at age 22. In 2020, the typical woman gets married for the first time at age 27, and the typical man gets married for the first time at age 29. In 1950, a lot of people would leave their homes and their vehicles unlocked because crime rates were so low. That's right. In 2020, many that live in urban areas are deathly afraid of all the civil unrest that has erupted, and gun sales have soared to an all-time record high. That's right. In 1950, Americans have actually attempted to parent their children. In 2020, we pump every kid full of mind-altering drugs, and we let our televisions and our video games raise our kids. Amen. Don't bother me. Sit down and play with your tablet. 1950, Baltimore was one of the most beautiful and most prosperous cities on the entire planet. In 2020, Baltimore regularly makes headlines because of all the murders that are constantly occurring of course, the exact same thing could be said of many of our other major cities. We're just using that for an example. Mm -hmm. yeah. Notice this, 1950, 78% of all households in the United States of America contain a married couple. Mm -hmm. In 2020, that figure is well below 50%. In 1950, about 5% of all babies in the United States were born to unwed parents. In 2020, over 40% of all babies in the United States are born to unmarried parents. In 1950, new churches were regularly being opened all over the United States. In 2020, especially during the pandemic, it is projected that one out of every five churches could be forced to shut their doors in the next 18 months. And the mayor of Lubbock, Texas, just said that opening a new Planned Parenthood clinic is like starting a new church. In 1950, we actually had high standards for our elected officials, and people actually did research on the candidates before they cast their votes. Just a few weeks ago, in 2020, more than 4,000 people in one county in New Hampshire voted for a transsexual satanic anarchist in the Republican primary. They didn't even look the person up. They didn't do any research. They thought, that's a Republican? Yeah, I'll vote. And it was a satanic transsexual anarchist running as a joke mm -hmm. to prove a point that nobody researches candidates anymore. Come on. Yeah. Wow. And this person is now the Republican nominee for the sheriff in Cheshire County. Oh, no, man. 1950, children would go outside and play when they got home from school. Mm -hmm. 2020, our parks and our playgrounds are virtually empty, and we have the highest childhood obesity rate in the industrialized world. Kids don't play outside hardly anymore. No. Kids don't play in the woods anymore. No. I grew up playing in the woods. No. My brother and I walked around, and man, we had to scream back in the woods. We thought it was the coolest thing. We'd catch little crawdads out of there. We'd shoot minnows in the stream, and we'd jump in and play. Come to find out years later, there was a little bit of sewer run off in that stream. We didn't know about it. <laughs> My brother and I talked recently. We went on a trip. I said, you know what? No wonder we didn't get sick from all this stuff. And we grew up playing in a sewer. <laughs> <laughs> We're immune from everything. Uh -huh. right. Amen. Right. Amen. Amen. We used to go play in the woods. We'd have knives and we'd carve stuff and make little fires. And I'm not advocating all that. I'm just saying it was a different day. It was Amen. a different time. He didn't call the police when he saw a couple neighborhood boys walking by with BB gun. They were just up to their normal, you know, right, right. shooting squirrels and birds. Right. Maybe you're not. 
1950, front porches were community gathering areas, and people would regularly have neighbors over for dinner. In 2020, let's get real, many of us don't even know the first names of our neighbors. Right. This is going to shock you. The average American watches more than five hours of television every single day. Five hours. That's 35 hours a week. That's a full-time job, folks. Some people are having terrible financial problems. If you would go to work as long as you watch TV, your financial problems would be over. Right. Hey, don't say you don't have time. You do have time. Amen. Am I listening? Yep. Amen. In 1950, Americans used words like knucklehead, jalloping, jalopy, moxie. 2020, new terms such as nomophobia, people kind. Not man kind or woman kind, but people kind. And social distancing. I had never heard the term social distancing until March of 2020. And I've heard it enough in the last six months to make up for a whole lifetime. In 1950, the very first credit card was issued in the United States. In 2020, just Americans, this is going to shock you, put your seatbelts on. Just Americans owe more than $930 billion with a B dollars on credit cards. Only in America. That's not counting other states. Almost a trillion dollars in credit card debt. In 1950, one income could support an entire middle class household. In 2020, tens of billions of Americans have lost their jobs, filed for unemployment, and more than half of all households in some of our largest cities are currently facing serious financial problems. In 1950, American people believed that the free market should govern the economy. In 2020, most Americans, alarmingly, are beginning to believe that the government in Washington and the Federal Reserve should manage the economy. Folks, listen. The government can't run the economy for you. There has to be a free market economy, the free hand of, of, uh, of the market moving. And uh, there are forces in the market. When you start allowing the government to run the economy, we become a socialistic nation. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Do you really want the government managing your health care? They can't even pay a road. It takes them four years to pay a road on I-40. Yeah. <laughs> and you want them determining when you get your lung transplant? I mean, I'm not being, this is not political. We're talking common sense. Right. Put aside whether you're a Republican or Democrat or whatever you are. Do you really want the government managing your health care? No. That's alarming. In 1950, socialists and communists were considered to be our greatest national enemies. In 2020, most of our politicians in Washington have eagerly embraced socialism and communist policy goals. Again, I'm not being constitutional. I mean, uh, I'm not being political. I'm just showing you a juxtaposition how far we moved in 70 years. And we brought a lot of pain and suffering on our own selves. That's true. That's true. Right. In 1950, the U.S. Constitution was deeply loved and highly revered. In 2020, if you dare to admit that you are a constitutionalist, you might as well say you're a domestic terrorist. That's right. That's true. In 1950, the United States loaned more money to the rest of the world than any other nation. And in 2020, the United States owes more money to the rest of the world than any other nation. In 70 years, we've completely reversed. Right. In 1950, the U.S. national debt reached the $257 billion mark for the first time in history. 257. In 2020, we added $864 billion with a B dollars to the national debt just in the month of June. Let me say that again. 1950, our total national debt was $257 billion. $257 billion. In 2020, just in June, we added, just in one month, 
$864 billion to the national debt. In other words, we added over three times more to the national debt in one month than the total amount of debt that had been accumulated from the founding of our nation until 1950. Something's wrong. In 1950, most Americans were generally happy with their lives. And suicide was something you rarely heard about. In 2020, the suicide rate is at an all-time record high, and since 2007 to now, 2020, it has gone up every single year. The suicide rate has increased. We're talking about the suffering of the innocent. And the truth of the matter is, is that we have a generation coming up, young people and children, that didn't do anything. That I just said. They, were, they didn't have any part in either, any of this I just said. Amen. They're truly innocent. Even natural disasters are the result, as I mentioned, of a planet that is growing. I read you Romans 8 22. I believe that our planet, not just from a natural resource standpoint, but from a spiritual standpoint, this planet was created by God. Amen. And I believe that our planet itself is crying out to the Lord, please return. Please come back and get your people off of here. Yeah. Yeah. Right. No one is exempt from these sufferings. Let's talk about true innocence. In its truest sense, there is really no such thing as innocent suffering on this planet. We humans like to think of ourselves as moral and virtuous creatures. But the book of Romans gives us a clear insight into the true state of mankind. Romans 3.10, Paul said, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Yes. Even infants and children and others who are mentally immature are inheritors of the sinful human nature and given time and opportunity, they too would sin and transgress God's law. King David acknowledged this point. Like the rest of mankind, he was a partaker of the sinful nature even before birth. Psalm 51 and 5, David said, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Humanity can only boast of one truly innocent man. And we killed him. Come on. Come on. Man. The only truly innocent being to ever walk on this planet. Amen. We crucified. Right. Jesus Christ suffered and died in order to deliver us from the curse. And the innocent one suffered so that we might annihilate the suffering of the guilty. So that he might annihilate the suffering of the guilty. Let me read out 1 Peter 2 and 21. We'll put it on the screen there. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow in his steps. Amen. He did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, he reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not. But he committed himself to him that judged righteously. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. That we being dead to sins should live under righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. Folks, I'm thankful that he gave his life for me. Amen. What I just read is powerful because Jesus Christ not only died for the sins of everybody at that moment. But he died for the sins of everybody up to that moment. But here's the miraculous part. He didn't just die for the sins of that moment and the sins of that moment. He also died for the sins that haven't even occurred yet. The sins of people that weren't even born yet. He looked ahead in time and he said, there are there's going to be sin for me. And I'm going to give my life for those people. How dare you and I sit here this morning or go about our week this week and act like we're somebody that we deserve mercy. We deserve grace. We were born in sin. If it wasn't for a merciful, loving, saving God, every single one of us would be on our way to hell. If it wasn't for His forgiveness, if it wasn't for His grace, where would we be? Church. 
shudder to think, where would we individually be if it wasn't for God orchestrating our path? Amen. Praise God. I feel his presence. Let's lift our hands and thank him right now. Father, I thank you for your mercy. God, I didn't do anything to deserve being where I am. I didn't deserve, I don't deserve your grace. I don't deserve your love. I don't deserve you forgiving all of my sins. I don't deserve you wrapping yourself in a human body and coming to this earth and becoming the sacrifice for all of us, Lord. Thank you for your love. Don't ever let me take it for granted. Don't ever let me trespass on the blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, I'm a part of the human race, and the human race has fought you for, for ages. The human race has, has polluted our planet. The human race has transgressed against your word. And I'm a part of the evil that's been to us. And I thank you for showing mercy to me. Somebody say amen. amen. It is dangerous to presume to judge God and his ways. We may not understand all the pain we see in the world, but we are foolish to blame God for his suffering. Right. Amen. That's right. This type of attitude is similar to that of an injured dog who bites the hand of the person trying to help it. Uh -huh. Thinking that this caring person is the one causing the torment. They're not only trying to provide help. I've preached funerals of children before. I've preached funerals for people that were too young to have died. I've preached funerals for people that were in the prime of their life. And I've had to stand here and act like I was strong and in my own spirit, thinking, God, this doesn't make sense. Amen. Why didn't you just go to the dregs of society? Get the pimp. Get the drug dealer. Get the rapist. Get the child molester. Get the thief and the robber and the extortioner. And take them out. Amen. Leave this innocent. But we don't understand God's ways. Right, right, right. right. Come on. Amen. We don't have enough wisdom. Understand the level that he operates. Amen. Amen. That's right. Amen. We have to remember Romans 8 28, and we know that all things work together for the good. Amen. To them that love God, to them who are the call according to his purpose. Amen. We cannot fully understand God's ultimate wisdom any more than a newborn infant can understand why his mother does what it does, what she does. Only the creator of all reality can establish the standards of ultimate righteousness and equity. Only God is qualified to define justice and truth and then to execute justice and truth. Amen. Romans 9.20 Name it, O man, who art thou that replies our disputes against God? Shall the thing form say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Can you imagine a lump of clay talking back to the potter? That's right. Come on. They tell the potter, I don't want to be a platter. I want to be a cup. Right. The potter's the one that decides what the clay is. Right. The clay doesn't tell the potter what it is. Right. Psalm 145, 17. The Lord is righteous. Somebody say righteous. Right. That word means just. In all ways. Folks, you've got to sink your faith into these verses and say, I don't understand why innocent people suffer. I don't understand why pastors die from COVID-19. I don't understand why good Pentecostal people die in car wrecks. I don't understand why morally pure people are, are having so many different issues. But we've got to sink our faith in this verse and say, but God is just in all of his ways. Right. Amen. And holy. In all of his works. That word holy means completely good. Amen. God's purposes are often hidden from us. Sometimes they are beyond our comprehension. It is not always possible for our limited minds to discern the purposes of God's unlimited wisdom. Right. We will never understand all the reasons and purposes for pain and suffering in this world. It is beyond us. The only thing that I can think is maybe the Lord's just trying to get people's attention. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's right. Oh, yeah. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. If we genuinely seek God's will and His way, He will impart His comfort yes. to us. In other words, if He takes you to it, He can lead you through it. Yeah. If He puts you in the lion's den, He can shut the mouth. Oh, yeah. 
If he puts you in the fiery furnace, he can cause the fire not to hurt you. Hebrews 4.15, and I come to a close. We have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. That's written in the old King James English. It's a double negative. The way you should read that is this. We have a high priest that can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. And was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Everybody say all points. All points. So Pastor, I can't even pay my bills. Jesus gets it. Amen. I heard him right here in my body. He gets it. Right. I have trouble in my family. He gets it. Hallelujah. I was tempted the last week. Man, I almost came in. He gets it. Yes. The Bible says in all points. Now, folks, all means all. Amen. He was in all points tempted like that. Amen. You name a temptation today, however gross, however filthy the sin might be. All points tempted like as we are. Amen. Hallelujah. Yet without sin. Amen. Satan dares to tell us that the suffering of apparently innocent people is evidence that God no longer cares about humanity. But the Bible lets us know that is not the truth. God cared enough about humanity not to annihilate the human race at the fall of the garden. God cared enough about humanity to prepare a way by which he could be reunited with us. God cared enough about humanity to wrap himself in human form and to suffer and give his life for us. The Bible says he cares enough that he weeps. No one has ever been so misunderstood, so hated, and so reviled as God is every day. And he is hated by the very ones that he wrapped himself in flesh to die for. Amen. Amen. Does God take pleasure in the suffering of man? No. He is grieved by it so much that he took his place among the innocent suffering. Isaiah 53. Let me close with this passage of scripture. We're going to read Beginning in verse number three. He is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows. Acquainted with grief. Isaiah 53, 3. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, we have seen him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs. Everybody say griefs. Grief. He has carried our sorrows. Everybody say sorrows. Sorrows. Imagine Jesus reaching over and taking that heavy load of grief off you and putting it on one arm and taking that heavy load of sorrows off you and putting it on the other arm and saying, let me carry this for you. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Isaiah says we are healed. Peter comes along and repeats Isaiah's prophecy, and Peter says we were healed. That's not a contradiction, folks. Isaiah was pointing forward to the cross. Peter was looking back at the cross because at the cross the stripes were taken for the healing of the nation. Jesus can heal COVID. Yes, he can. You know, oh, Pastor, we need a vaccine. We do need a vaccine. I get that. We still need to be careful. We all need to be careful doing what we're doing. But we cannot look at the Word of God and carve out an exception and say the Lord can heal cancer and he can heal diabetes, he can heal blood pressure, but he can't heal COVID, man. COVID, COVID, no, no, no. Jesus is bigger than COVID. Jesus never turned around and said one word 
in defense for himself. That's right. That's right. That's right. Pilate even mocked him and said, Are you the king? And Jesus said, Thou sayest it. Right. Right. Uh, right. I didn't say it. You said it. That's right. That's right. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb. The word dumb there does not mean lack of intelligence. It means that the lamb that is being sheared by the shearers doesn't talk back to the shearer. It just lets it happen. Right. That's, right. That's right. So he opened about his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? He was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people. Was he stricken? And then you go on and on and on. Read down through verse 12 sometime when you have a chance. Here's my point. Satan asked the question, where is God to be found in the suffering of innocent people? And here's the answer. At the cross. Amen. The cross is the nexus Amen. of mankind and Jesus. The cross. It's either laid out in the cross. It's the nexus. It's the juncture. It's the intersection between man and God. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Where is God? How does he sympathize with everything I'm going through at the cross? Yes. Yes. If we want to judge God's reaction to the suffering of humanity, we've got to judge it by his own action at the cross of Calvary. If we want evidence of God's love towards suffering humanity, we can see it in the Apostle John's statement. 1 John chapter 4, verse 9. In this was manifested the love of God toward us. Everybody say, in this. In this. So here's John fixing to tell us. John fixing to say, look, I want to show you how much Jesus loves you. Because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live Herein is love. Everybody say herein. herein. I'm fixing to show you where love is. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. The word propitiation means atonement or payment. Yes. So God looked down at the suffering and He said, "Humanity has just made a mess." I'm going to wrap myself, I'm going to come down from heaven, I'm going to wrap myself in a human body, I'm going to walk among my people for 33 and a half years, and I'm going to let my creation put me on a cross to become the sacrifice that the Old Testament plan required for sin. But this one sacrifice is going to be a sacrifice of all ages. No more lambs are going to have to die after this. And that's why John the Baptist called Jesus the Lamb of God. Amen. John 1, 29, John baptizing people in the river Jordan. He looks up, he sees his cousin walking toward him, and he says, Behold the Lamb of God who has taken away the sin of the world. Right, yes. Brother Kevin, he didn't call him the Prince of Peace. Brother Derek, he didn't call him Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nissi, Jehovah Shalom, Jehovah Rohi, Jehovah Sifidu, all these Hebraic terms of titles of God. He called him an animal. Because Jesus Christ is all these other things. But more importantly, he's my sacrifice. Amen. He's my Savior. Amen. He wasn't my Savior, he couldn't heal me. That's right. That's right. He wasn't my Savior, he couldn't provide for me. If he wasn't my Savior, he wouldn't be a friend that's even closer than our mother. If he, if he wasn't my Savior, he wouldn't be my strong tower in my defense. Amen. Amen. He's my Savior first, and he's everything else. Amen. 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 Let's stand together. The problem of pain was caused by mankind, but it ultimately will be solved by our loving, caring God who chose to suffer with us. Soon and very soon we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon we are going to see the King. You know what I'm saying? Soon and very soon we are going to see the King. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! We are going to see the King. 
No more dying there. You believe that? We are going to see the king. No more dying there. We are going to see the king. No more dying there. We are going to see the king. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are going to see the king. What you and I need to understand every day as we're hearing the deluge of bad news. 800 more cases of COVID, 900 more hospitalizations, 205,000 people have now died, fires all over the United States and California, monster tornadoes coming up from the Gulf of Mexico, to Tupelo, Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, Texas. Amen. Crazy stuff happening all over our world. Wars and rumors of wars all over our world. Amen. We can see the one world government forming right before our very eyes. It's happening right now. And when all we seem to do is when we hear all that, lift up our eyes. Oh, yeah. Amen. Say, I know there's a lot of suffering, but sooner, sooner, very soon, Jesus is going to end it all. He understands where I'm at. I'm in the world, but I'm out of the world. This power that he gave me is going to get me out of here.